Hi, thank you all for coming this afternoon on such a beautiful Friday. We really appreciate your being indoors with us here. And thank you to all the great speakers before me and after me. Um, following the ladies Jan was talking about, it's going to be tough, but I'm going to do my best. Because uh, I myself am a woman going through change right now and trying to reinvent myself career-wise. And that's part of what I'm going to talk to you about today, is the concept of being a beginner of what it was like to come here at age 50 and start an MBA program for something in a totally different realm from what I had done before. And hopefully leaving here as someone who's going to lead community change. Conditions are never perfect when you're starting something that gives you a little trepidation. You just have to dig in and start. Well, in my background, I worked in the corporate world for over 20 years. Big companies, little startup companies, um, I always found my niche and I made the best of it, but it wasn't really where I felt I had a lot of passion or I was making a difference. Um, my husband and I joke regularly that we were going to go work for Greenpeace when we retired. Well, 2009 rolled around and the situation was as good as it was ever going to get for me to take a risk and try to do this sooner than later. So I started looking into schools, into programs, into where I thought I could get what I needed to move into a new world, to do something completely different. And I came here to Antioch and I sat through practicum presentations of that graduating class and I wanted to be one of them. So I'm pretty excited that I get to stand here before you today as one of them. So May 31st of 2010, I left my job. The very next week in June, I started here as a student. <laughs> um, I have to tell you, my first week here, I was pretty intimidated by this group. They all seemed to know where they wanted to go, what they wanted to do. And I was like, oh, I have no clue. I don't know what I'm going to do with myself. I talked to Polly about it. I talked to Robbie about it. And they both said, be a beginner. This is a gift. It's all new. Take it all in. See what happens. See what grabs you. So I tried. I'll try to keep an open mind. I'll try to be the beginner. This is not my nature. This was really hard for me, something I had trouble getting my arms around. But one of the greatest gifts my parents ever gave me was a real love for nature and the outdoors. And in some of the pictures I'm going to share with you of vacations we've taken, I hope you see some of that. <laughs> so I knew this was going to be a struggle for me. So one of our first classes, we had to come up with a mission statement. So I decided mine was going to be to focus on my personal growth for two years to really explore and nurture new ideas, to look for that path for something more meaningful. I needed something I could go back to when the job called and asked me to come back and consult. I needed something to hold on to when I really felt like, I can't do this, it's too late to do this. Once I got into the classes, every subject was fascinating and I wanted to learn more. If I ever needed a confirmation that I needed a change, that was it. I mean, I actually got excited when we did accounting here. <laughs> Part of taking advantage of the opportunities and being open to new things was taking the study abroad trip to Sweden. Now, in all honesty, I did it because I knew it would be a fun trip. I had a great group of people to travel with. I had never stayed in a hostel before, certainly not on a boat. I knew we were going to have fun. But I knew we were also going to do a trip very different from your typical tourist trip. We joked a lot about exactly what exploring and studying Swedish models would be all about. Um, I didn't understand, I didn't anticipate just how much of powerful impact it would have on me to go on this trip to Sweden. To be immersed in a culture where people treated their resources and their land so differently. Because this is a very industrialized place. The Stockholm was like any big city I had ever been in, except there were a lot more rivers. It, but people were so cautious. People were so aware. Um, and I was struck by that. We spent time with executives running big companies, running municipalities, with um, gardeners who you know, truly loved the earth. Um, but for me, the biggest day was the day we spent that we had an author along with us for the entire day. Um, I'll, I'll mess up his name, but we were eventually allowed to just call him TB because we couldn't say Torborn correctly. Um, but we had Torborn Lahi with us for a whole day. He's the founder of the eco-municipality movement in Sweden. He's worked with over 100 municipalities, and he's a co-author of 
The Natural Step for Communities, which has now become my go-to book for everything that I'm studying. He spent a day with us going to one of the cities, uh, taking a biofueled bus to the dump, touring the dump with us, and eventually we ended up in this park. And after we listened to him speak for a while, his closing comment was something along the lines of, well, you're now all my little bumblebees going back out into the world. And I thought that was pretty sweet, and I really thought it was more about you know, going out into the world and spreading the message. Well, after I read his book, I realized what it was really about was talking about an aeronautics engineer who apparently hung a sign up in his company that said, according to the laws of aerodynamics, bumblebees should not be able to fly. But since they don't study aerodynamics, aerodynamics, they do fly. So what he was telling us is, there are no rules, just get out there. Now I wondered how I could bring back anything that I saw in Sweden here. It just didn't seem possible. And that led to my practicum, which was looking into how to engage communities here in sustainability initiatives. One of the reasons I think we struggle here is the problems are huge. They're too huge, and we tend to think, what can I do? Uh, this is what's left of the glacier in Glacier National Park. It was, for me, pretty overwhelming to see that and think, there's nothing I can do about that. But that doesn't mean I can't do something. And I think that groups of people obviously can accomplish a lot more than individuals. So I started studying the municipality movement in Sweden. I studied large and small projects here in the US, everything from small community urban gardens to the New England Sustainable Communities Project, which involves six towns up in uh, northern New England. I researched on the internet, I had interviews with a variety of people, I read books, I went to climate change meetings, I gathered a ton of information. I did a lot of volunteer work, and the thing was, everything new I learned created more questions and created a situation where I wanted to learn more. Well, then Robbie tells me, narrow my focus. <laughs> you got to pick one thing and go with it. <laughs> so what I realized is that in my work in corporate America, what I really did like was bringing together groups of people to implement new policies, to implement new technology. It was fun to bring in all those div diverse people into a room and help them come to a decision that really made sense, to let their voices be heard, and to let them really speak out. If they had a concern, say it now, or we're moving on. And I thought, well, it's the same in the community projects. You need to bring those people together, get them to talk, listen to them, and move on. And I thought, well, I could take my corporate experience with me and you know, teach communities about how to do things. But the more I researched it, the more I think businesses can learn just as much from community projects as the other way around. Um, the biggest similarity between the two People are the most important thing for any initiative to go forward, and you have to have a good and flexible plan. So for people, uh, ones that are a little different in a community venture versus a business venture is um, the concept in the natural step is to have fire souls. These are the people that have the passion to get out there and make things happen. They're going to stick with the initiative from day one to the end. And community initiatives take a long time. Uh, in the business world, we plan a project, it gets done or it doesn't get done. In the community world, there's a hundred things that can go wrong that, that derail a project. So you need the people that really have the passion to see it through to all the way. Uh, I've met a few of these people while I've been doing interviews, while I've been doing some volunteer work or even interning um, with a solar company. And it, it's the people that get you really excited about it, that are speaking from their soul. Not just a good salesman, but the people that when they look you in the eye, you know that they're really committed to what they want. And the other piece is building community capacity. Uh, where I saw some failures in community projects, or where people didn't really involve that greater community, they thought they had a great idea and they just ran with it. Um, you have to really listen to what the community wants and respond to their needs. You might run into some negativity, but better to know that up front than at the end. One of the things that I read about that surprised me the most was an effort in Africa um, to take some very fish-rich lakes and create sort of uh, farm fisheries there. Well, the reason this really struck me 
is because this happened not once, but twice, that Norwegian investors invested between 10 and $20 million and businesses failed miserably because the people in these areas were nomadic herdsmen. They had no interest in fishing. They had, had no interest in fish. So even though they built these great facilities, no one wanted to work there and no one wanted the product. Next we have what seems obvious, but I think we tend to not really consider, is engaging officials. A lot of community movements are more grassroots. They're kind of avoiding the officials, but eventually you're going to need them to try to get them on your side early. Uh, volunteers are going to be the lifeblood of a lot of projects. And having done a lot of volunteering, it's kind of, um, you become the forgotten person when there's meetings. You're not there every day. You're not there all the time. So I think it's important to really make sure your volunteers stay engaged. Uh, volunteers volunteer for a variety of reasons. And if you don't keep them engaged, they're going to move on. And then the implementers. Um, the people that are going to own that project after you're gone have to be involved in the star. Or like those fish factories, it's not going to work. As I mentioned, planning is pretty important. You need a mission. You need something to go back to. Uh, as people have mentioned earlier, you need to be able to measure what's going on. That will help drive the plans. And you have to go back periodically and look at your plan and see, does it need to change? Or has it been blown off course, but that's okay. This is a better course to go on and go back and reevaluate. So we talk here a lot about what does wild success look like. And as a beginner, I'm still trying to figure that out. It's a little scary. Every day there seems to be another success, and that's a great thing. Um, so I'm moving on here, no longer a beginning MBA, but ending, hoping to go out into my community and make a change. So right now, um, part of being flexible was looking at a number of projects to keep going so that I had reference points for this practicum. I'm still finishing up an internship with Integrated Solar. I'm working in my town on a sustainability committee, trying to make something happen there. I want John's program for them. And I'm working with the Regional Environmental Council in Worcester, uh, which is basically a social justice foundation, but one that's trying to make a change in urban environments. So in closing, I just wanted to say that I think it was our first week here on a very rainy, woodsy walk. <laughs> Um, we, Wessels. With Tom Wessels, um, we, we learned about the fact that there is a limit to growth. There is a limit to how much growth nature will allow and what's acceptable. But where I stand today, it's like there isn't a limit in personal growth, and there isn't a limit in the kind of growth that we can have from a society's perspective if we all pull together. Thanks. <laughs>